What is up, everyone? I am here with... My, am I supposed to introduce myself? No. I, I'm, I'm, I, was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to think, should I introduce you as Stephanie, who nobody knows? Nobody knows Stephanie. Or should I say Queen of Reef? And more people might know who that is. But it also sounds really like... <laughs> go with Queen of Reef. Queen of Reef. You will I go with Queen that. of Reef from the Instagram and YouTube fames. Woo! Welcome. Welcome. So I am over here in Dallas, Texas. I'm visiting some friends and also attending the Aquashella show. And so one of the friends that I'm um, meeting up with is Stephanie here. And I actually met her a couple of years ago. And she has no recollection of this, but it was at the very first Dallas Aquashella. We literally said hi. And that was it. I... I, I I don't remember this. Yeah, exactly. We that, so that was that was the official first time that did I that awkwardly we reintroduce myself. No, we. I I, I think um, I was hanging out with Rico there, and you guys had more of a rapport. Like you guys knew who each other were, right. and then I just happened to be the guy standing next to Rico. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh i'm sorry so that that's the first time I'm, that i met you but i think that uh, the first time that we actually talked was at aquashella orlando this past year yes and that was actually weirdly fortuitous because i had heard of a party going on at top shelf aquatics and i wasn't invited but that's understandable because nobody, nobody, no, they're okay. No, no. <laughs> nobody at Top Shelf knew who the heck I was. They have no way of contacting me. Oh, right? you so, are being humble. No, <laughs> they don't know. Like, <laughs> swear to God, they, they don't know who I am. I went to the Top Shelf booth that was setting up the day before, mm -hmm. and I, I started chatting up uh, this guy named David, and uh, and he was just like, yeah, there, there's an event going on tonight. Uh, do you need a ride? And I'm like, absolutely, I need a ride, right? Mm -hmm. So this is gonna save me like like probably a seventy dollar Uber trip, and so it turns out that David is your boyfriend, and we we actually got to talk on the car ride over to Top Shelf. So I do have to say, thank you very much, David, for the ride. I, I appreciate it. I owe you one. I owe you an, an adult beverage at some point in the future. Sure. So yeah, so that 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 is how um, that's how we met that was for the fun. first time. That yeah. was a fun time. It was a good time. And now fast forward a few months, and I'm down in Texas. In my and, territory, yeah. my stomping grounds. And we're we're checking out her reef tank. Right off the bat, this is a new reef tank, right? Because previously you had uh, a smaller one set up and then you just kind of moved into a new one, right? Yeah, I had a 40 gallon that was set up for, uh, I, I want to say four, four years. And then I've had this 220, which is my third tank, and it's been running for about a year now. Definitely learned from the mistakes of my 40 gallon. And uh, taking my time, taking my time with this build. I mean, it took a while until I added any corals and everything. I really think tank maturity is good. So it took a long time to set it up, but it's starting to come together. I'm really happy about yeah, that. Yeah, and obviously the, the LPS are taking to their new surroundings a lot quicker than the SPS do. That's just yes. kind of how that is. Yes, it's a bit of a challenge because... SPS, I, I, I feel like they just thrive in a much more established system. I guess I push to move everything and add more uh, into the 220 earlier than I probably would have ideally just because a 40 gallon is very hard to keep up with, with the amount of corals I had in there and, and the rate they were growing. When you say that the, the smaller tank was more difficult, what specifically? Because it, clearly it's easier to do water changes, it's easier to scrape the glass, keep the substrate cleaned, right. the water topped up. So do you mean like water chemistry and, and, and whatnot, kind of keeping those figures in line? Right, yeah, water chemistry. I mean, the issue with having such a small tank is you're kind of limited in equipment like dosers. You know, I mean, that's what caused the initial crash when the tank was first starting was that it kind of overdosed on me. Oh. And in a big tank, that can still happen, right? But you have a little bit more time to work with there. I don't trust a doser on a 40 gallon. When the corals started really growing in and taking off, it's just so hard to keep that thing stable mm. by hand. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I think a lot of people kind of underestimate is just like how dynamic an aquarium is when stuff starts to grow because you could literally have the same quote-unquote number of corals right. but if they're growing they could be double the size very quickly 
and then all of a sudden it's like your your demand for calcium alkalinity magnesium for example it's double and you haven't changed anything oh yeah and now you've got like a big problem on your hands oh yeah and it happens overnight it's always overnight too you're so used to this dosing schedule you know you've got it all under control and then overnight everything just pops off and grows and then now you can't even keep up with it and it Oh, and yeah. it, the fluctuations, it's not good for, especially the SBS that were in that 40 gallon. They cannot handle that kind of, and it just, in a larger tank, it definitely comes down a lot more slowly. Out of curiosity, how often were you testing? About once a week, but at, really? towards the end when things started growing, it had to be yeah, several times a week, three times. Maybe. Three times a week, wow. I sound bad, but there were times where I didn't test hardly ever. And now we test almost daily at our facility. But yeah, I mean, it's it's actually really good to be able to just to test once a week. Right, it depends on your tank, like at the stage it's at. If the tank is stable, if you're able to anticipate the consumption rate, you know, then you can test you can once be, a week you can every be two more, weeks, you know, but you have to understand what's going on with your tank, you know. Um, can be more important. derelict like mine. <laughs> I have this feeling that a lot of people that get into this hobby really aspire to a big tank. And then they get a big tank one day. And then they realize, oh no, I made a terrible, terrible mistake. <laughs> like, because there's a, there's a bunch of people that I think that like their, their dream tank might be like a 500 gallon tank. Right. And then it's like, oh yeah, you probably didn't know this, but a 500 gallon tank, that's a full-time job. Oh yeah. That's 40 hours a week. Oh yeah. The cost of <laughs> salt. I mean, that's not something I really thought about much. I mean, just the amount of salt. The and, buckets. And to store <laughs> lots of salt. Oh yeah. In, in the RDI unit. I have a pretty hefty RDI unit that I'm probably going to need to upgrade now. Just because the, the amount of water oh, can be really frustrating sometimes. I mean, I, I was definitely that person. Somewhere in between, I think maybe a little less than 200 gallons, maybe like 150. Having said that, I think that the, the fish certainly will like it a lot better in a, in a bigger box. That, that, that helps a lot too, because this is your first time messing with tangs, right? Yes. Or any fish, really. I mean, I've, I've only kept fish for utility purposes, uh -huh. but I could never keep kind of many fish options at all. Let's back up. So when you had the smaller, like 40 gallon tank, what did you have going on in there as far as fish? Two clownfish and a uh, yellow watchman goby. Okay. And so when you say utility, it's more just like a nitrogen source from... Yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. Fish poop going in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but in you... this tank, I have more to play around with fish and keep different kinds that I was never able to keep before. Like gotcha. Mm -hmm. You were never really into fish. Like you're not a fish person. You're a coral person. No, never been. Maybe briefly when I first started the hobby, but that kind of went away the second I got my first coral a few weeks later. So I've always really appreciated corals. Fish are wonderful, but they're not my primary focus. Never have been. I get this feeling that saltwater fish attract that initial interest. And then within no time at all, it's the corals that keep the person in the hobby. Oh yeah. Because how many fish only tanks do you see versus reef tanks? Oh no. At least, at least it'll, in the future it'll become, you know, a reef tank. For sure. Yeah. There's no way. There's no way. I see much fewer people that have reef tanks go back to fish only. No, like that no. almost never happens, no. right? No. Because the corals are the true addiction here. They are. To be honest, I don't think I know anybody that has a fish only tank. I don't think I do either. If anybody watching has a fish only. It's like, where? who, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> what are you doing? Are you lost? Do you exist? You got into the hobby at a good point because... There was a ton of information available online. When I started, she's making a face at me. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I first started into this hobby, there was really no internet. Like Google wasn't invented yet because I was still going to college with the guy that would eventually invent Google. And he hadn't done that yet. So we just had to be confused. Like the, it's like, it's like why, why, why is stuff going bad in the tank? I don't know. It just, it just looks bad. <laughs> I guess I'm just gonna have to be confused. Or you have to like rely on um, a friend your, of a friend or a friend. Loc <laughs> your, your local fish store. <laughs> right. And you just better hope that they're not trash. Right, right, right. So yeah, it was definitely harder. The problem when you started might have been like there's too much information and just divergent opinions on stuff. I made a face stand because there was a lot of information. There was. I don't know what on earth made me not really look at the resources I should have been looking at. I bought all of the books. They were all 
outdated information, I'm sure. There were a lot of things that I picked up that I wouldn't necessarily do today. I don't know. I searched on the internet, but it's almost like I found outdated advice. Even on the internet? Wow. I don't understand. I'm looking back and, and I, I don't know, I feel like I didn't know about the community. I didn't know that forums existed, so my search was very surface level. Aquarium 101, maybe not like specifically dedicated to saltwater creams. Like, hmm. I'm surprised that I got to this point using <laughs> that information because it was really outdated. A lot of the old stuff works. There's different techniques now. Some of it might be better. Some of it might definitely be worse. 100% for <laughs> oh, yeah. sure on that. Oh, yeah. But like, even like the, the super old stuff did work. You just might want to do something different for a completely different yeah. reason. That's a toughie because there's a lot of like old salt heads that <laughs> so are like, they are like lot. super get off my lawn about <laughs> this industry or, and this hobby. And they're not necessarily wrong. I mean, their, their attitude could probably use a little bit of an adjustment. But the, the, the husbandry information, I guess fundamentally a lot of it still works. So you're, you're probably fine, even if it didn't jive with like today's recommendations. I relied on water changes for everything. Mm -hmm. Basically, that was the only solution to my problems I had learned up to this point. Water change, water change, do this. Like hand maintenance is what I'm trying to say. Patience water? with that too. I mean, I got rid of pryopsis just through water changes. It That's took a long awesome. time. Yeah. But... Well, still, it turns out water changes are really good. They're really good. <laughs> and I feel like today we kind of overcomplicate things a lot. Simple actions do the best rather than throwing everything at a problem and then hoping one sticks. I feel like that ends up being putting you in a worse situation. Actually, I super agree with patience, that because I, I, I do like the, the water change and just like settle down. Right. And do, maybe do another water change and then settle down. But um, th this is a weird time when a lot of like the bottled products, okay, old man talking here, right? But back in the day, there was just like a lot of straight up fraudster snake, snake oil, oil pro products, yeah. right? But now almost all of these products work to some capacity. They do work. Right. There's, there's very few that are like true like garbage snake oil stuff. And I think that can be really overwhelming because you'll see people um, say, I had such great success killing Bryopsis with product X. But there's no product that's perfect. So product X probably does kill Bryopsis. But it might also have a side effect of killing all your Zoas. Right. And stuff like that. And, and, and people just like don't know the nuance to all these different solutions right. that have some capacity to work. And just being patient with a lot of problems. I think patience is a big factor of success in this hobby. And, and I, I think yeah. their patience is kind of slowing them. Case in point there, I guess. Because looking at your tank now, how long ago did you put your corals in? Uh, three months, four months? Three months, okay. In, in that ballpark okay. yeah well it looks like the the lps have settled right in and the a lot of the acropora are not happy they're not <laughs> it's it's not that they're not happy they're just not like super crazy colorful yet there's nothing really wrong it's just it's these things take time yeah. yeah and a less experienced hobbyist might go crazy and start trying to change a whole bunch of variables oh yeah the real solution is you just sit there and you wait. By the way, if you want to follow Stephanie, Queen of Reef, mm -hmm. uh, and just see uh, tank progress photos and stuff like that, it's probably what the best place to see is probably Instagram, maybe? Or do you think YouTube? Um, both. Both? <laughs> follow so both. So follow both <laughs> and compare with this video to see like how the colors of her SPS progress and watch. I'll, I'll jinx her completely and it'll all crash. Mm, don't do that. <laughs> But you can probably start seeing like massive improvements in like the next three months where like stuff gets a lot more vibrant. Oh yeah. Yeah, it, it does take time. I mean, with my 40 gallon, before I moved moved the corals over, the corals, the, they really brightened up the SPS in there, but it took a long time. I mean, when they were first added, it was the same kind of situation. I mean, it was a bit different because that tank was more mature, but it does take time. you got to let things settle in and grow in. And your tank just hits a point where it's stable. It's reached a certain level of maturity. And that's when everything kind of kicks off. But it's a lot of patience to get to that point, And I think it gets pretty frustrating. Sometimes when you're starting a new tank, just because it takes so long to see it look like what you initially envisioned. I mean, that is the true test of the hobby, of the patience, everything. Whether this is for you, because 
that tank is it's going to take a few years for it to really draw it's, your it's eye like and look amazing. It's like building a cathedral. <laughs> right. I mean, oh, it, it takes many years. And I think especially when you're starting out in the hobby, that's a really difficult thing to come to terms with. That's like, wait, you're telling me that my tank is going to look like this for, you know, three years? I, I don't know if I have the, you know can keep that up. Yeah, and I think that there's a major downside to starting with huge colonies, especially of things like Acropora, because these things grow to like a specific shape based on yeah. where they grew up. And now you're taking that, relocating into your tank where it's under different conditions, and you might struggle with a whole bunch of dieback versus starting with something that it's like a one inch piece that grows to that location over time. I mean, that's that's the fun part. It's the journey, not the destination. I would get so bored if I would set up a tank and then the next day it's like perfect finished product. It's a screensaver. Yeah, like it's just like, okay, well, where's the new tank? You know, that's the fun is seeing them grow and, you know, looking at your tank. It's all, oh, look at that little nub. And then, you know, it grew a little bit. It's, it's That's what makes it fun. Talk to me about this aquascape. It looks like a custom job. How did you go about putting that together? I really love minimalist aquascapes and I have gotten a lot of flack for them, even for the one in the 40 gallon, because when it's empty, it looks like there's nothing in there. But I, having a more simplistic structure to begin with, the corals grow in and then they fill up that space very quickly. So my idea was that I wanted something very simplistic and I wanted something that kind of branched out, something interesting. It looks like it's floating, you know? Mm -hmm. I want to keep SPS in this tank, I knew that. An issue that I had with the 40 gallon was that there was too much shadowing in certain areas of the aquascape. You couldn't initially see it when it was empty, but once the corals started filling in, there was the left side of my tank, I couldn't add any corals to it just because of the way the rock was shaped. So I really concentrated on not having any shadowing in this tank and mm. there is none. Quite proud of that because it's quite perfect for keeping acros. And I built it with a different kind of base than I usually have made in the past. I usually just when I put the rock together, stacked it. But I used a concrete base for this one. I used E, e Marco cement okay. and kind of created like a concrete patty of some kind. Okay, so to describe that for me again, so you use like the E Marco. So did you like make like a a foot? You yeah. made a foot made just a just foot. out of the that cement. Cement and to reinforce it, I added little pieces of rubble from my ah. rock and it created this kind of flat foot. And then once the sand is on top, it looks like it's floating. So that is interesting. Like that is the first time I, I heard of somebody doing that. Usually what we've done in the past was we would get one of those flat pieces of Marco rock that, yeah. that's been cut and then we build up from that. But so you just made your like a, an actual flat sheet yeah. of, of concrete. Wow. Like a proper, yeah, just wow. a foot. Of that's concrete. interesting. I wonder if anybody else has tried that before. I think I think maybe I've seen it. Okay. If you go on Instagram, there's a few minimalist aquascapes, um, water life my favorite they really inspired me with their aquascapes i love their aquascapes so much i saw that idea there mm -hmm. um, i didn't know how they made it but i kind of tinkered around and it, it works and it's it's actually really great technique because i was able to i mean that is a lot of rock for it to balance mm -hmm. you know yeah for sure i mean it's that was the issue with this aquascape is like how do i make it tall enough but also long enough to balance and not <laughs> hobble over so it was easy using the Emarco concrete base because I was able to, you know, shape it the way that would balance the weight the best. Nice. Quite That's really proud cool. of it. I love that thing. It's my second aquascape and I think it's it's pretty decent. <laughs> How did you do like the upper sections? Was it just like a bunch of smaller pieces that you cemented together? Yeah, so once I built the base and I started with creating yeah, like a base structure, I called it. So it was just the initial shape. Moving forward from the concrete, it was just kind of making something sturdy, elongated, and then the major branches. And then after that was done, I would detail it, I guess, taking little pieces of rock and adding little interesting pieces coming off of it to make it look more natural, to make it more visually interesting. As I was building this, I used super glue and instant set. Okay. I could visualize the shape and then after I got an idea of how it all looked together, then I would cement it down. I can't just draw 
an aquascape out ahead of time no, and then that, build that, it. I don't, think that, I don't think that works like ever. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it just, I kind of see how it goes and how it balances out. Mm -hmm. I can only see that when I'm. You can try to plan stuff up, but as soon as you start like, you know, fitting rocks together, it's like, Not it's gonna, good. it's gonna kind of do its own thing. Right. <laughs> Right, but I, I love using the super glue and it's a set. That made all of the difference. We've never done that at our place. We always did the super glue, the watery and super glue, mm -hmm. and the sand. Wait, wait, wait. To like cement it down? Yeah. When you use the watery in right. super glue right. from, we tried a whole bunch. The best one was Glue Masters brand. What would happen is the sand would immediately solidify. Huh. And so you just put a little bit more sand, put a little, and it just drizzle. The, Does it end up blending in with the rock too? It's Is the sand perfect. You can't oh, tell the difference. Okay, I have to try this technique now. Yeah, so you just basically like make a little sandbox, <laughs> and then you just like sand glue, sand glue, I sand love glue, that. sand glue, and it's sturdy enough to hold it. I mean, depending it's on the so size sturdy it. that if the thing breaks, it will be the Marco rock itself breaking, and not the joint. Yeah. So that's how we did all of our aquascape. I love that. I definitely need to try that. Having um, said that, the Glue Masters Super Glue that works the best, it is also like really noxious. You need to have a fan <laughs> blowing, otherwise it hurts your eyes and stuff. Um, and also, if you're wearing gloves, any kind of like cloth on the gloves, uh -huh. you can't get super glue on the cloth. It'll turn into lava. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so oh, jeez. You, you kind of have to know what you're doing a little bit. But literally, it is the, you, you just drizzle it on the sand. Right. And it's like, instantaneously rock hard now that is so cool yeah i definitely and, need to and you, you can just like sit there and you can just build it as fast as you can put sand and glue down that would be like a game changer yeah so you put like big rocks together this way and then lift the whole thing up i love that i love that <laughs> i love aquascaping i really want to start playing around and just making aquascapes for fun i mean that's one part of the hobby i'm just obsessed with all this like custom aquascape stuff is very new at least in the united states within like the last couple of years, I would say. Right. Before that, everybody was just stacking rocks. And looking back at what stacked rock aquascapes look like, it's like, hmm, it's, it's better yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely better now. This type of aquascape, so much more room for corals and the flow the and flow. life. The flow is the oh, game changer. It's just every coral. Is Especially once you get into big tanks, you're spending so much money trying to get good flow and then a dense aquascape is derailing this whole process. Right, right. And the shadowing, I mean, I really just, I, I love the minimalist look. A lot of people don't like the minimalist aquascapes. There's some arguments to have it a little bit more beefy. For example, I think that fish generally like more rock work and yeah. big chunkier pieces. I get that. At the same time though, the corals will eventually grow in and it'll be like a lot of rock work. It'll just be mostly right. coral. Right. And we kind of did something similar with our design with the idea that the corals are going to fill in. And once they all fill in, I still want the rock to be airy enough to allow for flow. Right. It's one of those things that just sorts itself out. Yeah. Wood time. Yeah. yeah. Again, with the patience. With the, <laughs> it all comes down to the patience. Talk about the gear. People are always into the equipment. Starting from the very top, what lighting did you go with? Radeon Gen 5s. Gen the blues. 5 blues. The blues. Got four of those. Like them so far? Love I love Radeons. Radeons. We, We're my we, favorite we, we've got like a very good relationship with Ecotech. So it's like, yeah, it's a pretty good light. No, I love the Radeons. <laughs> I love them so much. I mean, always. Once I tried the Gen 4s on my uh, 40 gallon, I'm no. I'm a Radeon for life. Yeah. Girl. Like, I, I'm not changing. You won't pry them out of my hands. Oh, <laughs> Going down a little bit further, uh, I see more Ecotech. Oh, I see, yeah. These are like what, MP40s? Or MP40s. MP10? 40s, okay. As much as I like Ecotech as a company. Not the biggest fan of their pumps. So I, I take that back. I used their Vectra pumps, but for some odd reason, I'm like the unluckiest MP purchaser ever. I've owned like an MP40 and I've owned an MP60, and both of them I had some weird issues with and ended up selling them. But yours seem to be like working well and quietly. Oh two things God. that mine never did no i i love them they're really good except i'm clumsy and i and that can be an issue with those powerheads is that i sometimes knock them over like from the inside of the tank or from the outside from the outside, from the outside. <laughs> oh yeah i'm like no and then i have to like yeah but they're they're great yeah and they you can't even hear them no, they're good pump yeah which powerhead. is so weird because like I, i'm like a psycho about sound mine sounded loud and bad and then they like destroyed themselves oh no because <laughs> so i'm like oh, okay it's probably just me 
because everybody else seems to be a lot more happy yeah. with them. I mean, listen, you can yeah. come in here. I, I, it's exactly. like there's no tank there. There was it's like wonderful. four of them running. And <laughs> one of those, I could hear it throughout my entire building. <laughs> oh, gosh. Probably because there was something wrong. But Defective anyway. ones. Need to try them again. Give them another uh, shot. No? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. You've got a sump. I do. It's my first sump. Okay. It's my first sump, and I'm super excited about it. It's so cool. And what is the return <laughs> pump on that sump? The Vectra. Okay. L2. 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 Yeah, L2. Yeah. Okay. What other things do you have going on in the sump? Protein skimmer, dosing, and whatnot? Yeah. Uh, protein skimmer. Those are... I haven't set it up yet, but okay. I have the Apex one. It's literally all ready to go. And my skimmer, I have the NIOS 220. I'm familiar with those. Yeah. We have those on our, really on our quarantines and stuff. And then I have my Fujian. Little castle. Got the castle on there. Cool. Filter sense. <laughs> got it all. I'm not a gearhead, honestly. I'm not a gearhead that I'm like real passionate about the gears, but I do want good gear, right? Yeah. It makes life a little easier. Oh, it makes for life sure. a lot easier when you don't have to worry about like the fundamentals. But I think at the end of the day, really, the only piece of equipment that's really, really important is um, lights. You think? Yeah. I feel like you can get, like, lights are the most essential to your success is what I'm trying to say. Protein skimmer, I mean, you can get by with other options or whatever and mm. good maintenance, like husbandry, but your lights are essential. I, I stand by that one. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, you see, you hear different, differing opinions on that sort of thing all the time. I don't really even have, like, a, a hot take on that myself because I've heard recently, like, some people are like, flow is even more important than lights. Yeah. And then water chemistry is more important than... And I'm just like... Any and all of these things could kill your tank if you do it badly. Right, like, right. And I mean, you can have perfect water, you can have perfect flow, but if your lights aren't good for the tiny girls you're keeping, they're not going to do well. They're not going to fare well. Everything comes into play, right, at the end yeah, of the day. Like, I, I mean, you I can't have one without the other. But yeah. I think if you're going to spend money on one item of equipment, like if you have a budget, you need to divvy up that. The lights, I think, mm. are the most important thing. That, that's an interesting thing. Like, where would I put my budget if I... If I had to like allocate, where could I cut corners? I would almost argue that you could probably cut corners on lights. Cause there, yeah. there's like some people that are having like really good success with like really cheap Amazon lights and stuff. Oh. Yeah, you're are like, you gonna put your SDS under the uh, Some people Amazon? do, some people, you know what, I, I haven't, uh, as far as like the LEDs go, I haven't done that. Like, I mean, you, like you've seen like pictures of my farm. It's like all like Radeons and, right. and, and Orphix and stuff like that. But no, I've, I've heard some people have some success with the really, really, really dirt cheap stuff. Then I think about like the pumps. I'm like, there's some pretty good, the inexpensive pump right. options out there. Like, you know, like CJ makes like a pretty good, relatively inexpensive pump. Yeah. It's like, I think if you know what you're doing, you can probably cut corners like all over the place. Oh, yeah. But you have to know what you're doing. <laughs> I guess right. that's like the bigger right. part of it. And it just depends on your goals too. This is like coming from the guy that like literally like has a biz everywhere. <laughs> has like cost no object, all this stuff. Like, yeah, you could probably do this for cheaper. I <laughs> definitely didn't. But you see, theoretically, I suppose it could happen. Changing gears once again. This is a relatively new system. Do you have any like big time future aspirations? Like what, what is your dream scenario tank? After this tank? Yeah. Cost no object. It'll, it'll fit in your space, whatever you were wanting. I am going back and forth. For a long time, I was like, well, I got a 40 gallon. Why did I jump to a 220? Because the next tank is going to be what? 1,000 gallons, 500 gallons. When am I going to, you know, how big can I keep going after this tank? And I don't know, recently I've been thinking like, um, I take a lot of joy from starting a new tank and seeing it progress and having it look different than the one before that I don't think I wouldn't per se go bigger. I would go through different smaller sizes. Like I'd go back mm. and circle around and get that you know, 175. And once I see the tank is finished and I kind of, I think it's like time to move on. <laughs> and I know that sounds really sick, but it's just like, I can't, I take pleasure from building it up. And I know a lot of people love that, you know, seeing the tank that's grown in and beautiful and just sit and watch it and just maintain that. But I don't really like that. Yeah, it's you completely. I think it the most fun for me was always in the setup process, not in the finished product. Yeah. The other thing that I think is really interesting is when you have more aquariums, you can commit to a certain aesthetic more than if you have one aquarium. Right. I see a lot of sameness in aquarium design where 
basically everybody just wants to fill their tank with their favorite corals. And you end up with essentially the same mixed reef as everybody that's out there yeah. versus having the flexibility of, you know what, I don't need to put every one of my favorite corals in this tank because I have six tanks. I can hard commit to a euphilia tank. Right. I can hard commit to a zoa only tank. Not just to cater the husbandry, but just the overall design. Right. And you can have like this like super striking like mushroom tank, that right. sort of thing. So yeah, I, I, I could totally see where having like a bunch of smaller focused aquariums right. could be really, really cool. Start having fun with it and getting creative. I would definitely like to do something that, like that in the future because I am really into aquascaping and it would be so fun to do, yeah, like you said, different styles of tanks that are totally different from each other. I mean, that would be, that would be really nice. All right. I think that pretty much does it from here. So thank you very much for having me. It was very nice to see you seeing your oh, aquarium. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Well, thank you for picking me up at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> real, real talk. Is that why we were doing this? You needed a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I needed a ride. Um, but yes, so guys, if you want to check out more of what Steph's got going on, definitely check out Queen of Reef on Instagram and the YouTubes. Check out that YouTube channel. <laughs> Watch my tag progress. Come together. I'm excited for it. Nice. Thanks again.